Good afternoon, good morning, Sabah al Khair, Bokir Tov. Um, we are starting now our first joint webinar in the US of IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and METO, the Middle East Treaty Organization. And um, without saying much more, my name is Sean Dolev, I'll be the moderator. I'm the executive director of the Middle East Treaty Organization. Speaker is uh, Dr. Jamal uh, Zogbi. James is the founder and president of the Arab American Institute, AAI a Washington DC based organization which serves as the political and policy research arm of the Arab American community. He's also managing director of Zogby Research Services, uh, which uh, specializes in groundbreaking public opinion polling across the Arab world. Um, thank you for joining us, James. I'm looking forward thank to you. Thank you. Look, um, I, I, when it comes to conversations about the, the JCPOA, I, I, I wanna borrow and do a twist on an expression of, made famous or infamous by John Kerry. Um, I, I was actually against it before I was for it. Uh, I was against it because I never understood why we would expend all of the political capital um, and all of the leverage that existed at the time uh, to stop Iran from building a bomb it didn't have. And even if it had, it couldn't use um, as, uh, as Ira made clear. <laughs> Uh, it is it is a death sentence on any country that uses it and on the entire region where it's used. Um, when we should have been doing it to focus on Iran's regional uh, behavior, uh, which was, after all, I think the, the major problem that countries in the region were concerned about. Um, and so I was, uh, I was not in favor. And I, I spoke to the Obama administration repeatedly about the need for uh, the creation of a regional security framework, uh, a compact, if you will, and that, that Saudi Arabia and Iran needed to be brought to the table to promote uh, security relations in the Gulf region directly. Um, they said, no, they don't want it. Uh, the Saudis won't come. And so they went and did the Iran deal, and that led Jamal to the, the capitulation that you noted uh, with regard to Yemen, um, which the Obama administration saw as a makeup. Um, there was an internal problem in Yemen, of course, that the Saudis were responding to. The GCC had spent considerable effort in negotiating a reform government, um, and it was Abdullah Ali Saleh and the Houthis who broke that agreement, and uh, that's another story. I mean, we're talking here about American policy. In any case, um, when the deal was complete, um, I felt an obligation to support my president and to support the fact that negotiations had occurred and had reached a deal. However imperfect it was, I supported it. And I think it's important to note that uh, there was significant opposition, not just on the Republican side. I was a member of the Democratic National Committee. I was chair of the Resolutions Committee. And we had a two-day brawl, myself and the chair of the, the DNC, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who did not want me to introduce a resolution supporting President Obama. I said, we cannot leave this meeting uh, without supporting our president. And she would not go with it. She said, no, I oppose this deal. I can't publicly uh, be associated with it. Um, and so we went uh, behind her back and we got uh, three quarters of the members of the DNC uh, to endorse our position supporting the president. There was another thing that happened. It wasn't just supporting the president and supporting the concept that negotiated uh, agreements needed to be honored. It was when I began to look at the polling that we were doing, not just in the Arab world, but more importantly in this instance in Iran itself. Arab opinion initially supported the agreement. They thought this is a first step um, and it, it seems to have settled some things down. But more significant and interesting for me was what it did in Iran. Um, we've been tracking Iranian opinion now for a decade. Uh, and what we found over the years was that when Iran is under attack from the West, uh, public opinion in the country ends up supporting whatever the regime is doing, as is logical in a country where when you're under attack by foreigners, you take this position. Uh, the, the notion that America has, some naive notion that some Americans have that Iranians love us and don't love their government is, 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 is just nonsense. So what we found was that uh, when we asked uh, Iranians about support for their government's policies in Iraq and in, 
Syria and in Yemen and Lebanon, uh, we found that numbers ranged almost in the 70, 80 percent favorable uh, range on, on, those, uh, on those engagements. After JCPOA, the numbers dropped by 40, 50 percent um, in, in almost each instance. It was no, bring the money home. Uh, they found peace as a way to uh, enhance their view that uh, personal freedom should be protected, jobs should be created, and we should not be involved so much in the region. They, there was a decisive move against it. As soon as Donald Trump uh, broke the deal, the thing flipped uh, back to the numbers that were previous supportive regime, uh, uh, the, the regime's involvement in the broader region, and um, and less focused on on, on domestic domestic priorities. Um, I think that what what we have to understand here is that um, uh, the breaking of the deal also shifted focus in the region among Arab public opinion to how um, how to deal with uh, with Iran uh, itself. While they had supported the agreement when Trump broke the agreement, they supported his breaking the agreement. Um, they also uh, began to express greater concern about Iran's nuclear program because once he broke the deal and the Iranians said, we're gonna accelerate our program, then people became concerned about it. But more significantly, the, the most elevated concern in the region was Iran's involvement in, uh, in Iraq in Lebanon, in Syria, and yes, in, in Yemen as well. In fact, what was most, I, I think, interesting to me was that in both Lebanon and Iraq, 70% uh, in public opinion said that their number one concern uh, was Iran's involvement in their country. Um, and let's understand, I mean, it, it's, Iran is not, as Jamal noted, it's not a benign player in the, in the region. I mean, Hezbollah has done damage to internal politics in Lebanon. Uh, the, 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 the PMUs, I mean, look, the, the Maliki government uh, aligned with Iran um, is a precipitator of what happened with ISIS uh, by pursuing a, a, a very significantly uh, disruptive um, uh, sectarian agenda. Uh, it pushed um, the Sunni community into a corner and resulted in uh, the situation that, that later developed into into the Islamic State. Uh, in Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, which at one point was viewed as heroic, uh, ha has come to be seen as an armed gang of thugs that will oppose anyone who, who, uh, who goes against them. And they want to, they've been disrupting the ability to form a government because they want to protect ministries that are critical uh, to their advantage. They've become uh, a, a, an armed gang like the other armed gangs that used to dominate uh, from the, the Maronite and Sunni sectors. Um, and they're not viewed favorably and Iran is viewed as behind it. So that uh, even among Shia in Lebanon and in, uh, in Iraq, you have uh, negative views uh, today on, on Iran's involvement. So that's kind of where we are. Um, there, is, th there are two factors that have to be understood. One is that the war to depose Saddam in Iraq unleashed Iran in the region and emboldened Iran in the region. It also so diminished the United States and altered the dynamic in terms of the regional politics that today you have no, I mean, we can't talk about the United States as the, the regional superpower. What we have to do is talk about the United States as a player among other players, some of whom are more decisive. Um, there is not a single regional conflict involved in across the Middle East, North Africa, that doesn't involve in one form or another, Russia and Turkey and Iran and Saudi Arabia and UAE and Egypt, and to some extent, the United States and even other players as well. And in different combinations, you have them going at each other so that the ability of the United States to dominate in a situation is limited today by the fact that you have this complex relationship, which is why I've argued that instead of um, focusing again the energy on what I believe is ultimately as dangerous as it is, it's a side issue, the nuclear issue, 
What we ought to be focusing on is creating a regional security framework, a broader regional security framework that yes, involves nuclear free zone, that yes, involves non-aggression agreements, that yes, involves respect for sovereignty of every country. Um, and yes, even goes to promoting regional investment and, um, uh, and trade. Uh, it may be a pipe dream, but it's as big a pipe dream as focusing on the nuclear issue by itself and assuming that the minute you get that, everything falls into place. It does not. I believe that as we stabilized uh, Eastern, Western Europe uh, during the Cold War with an OSCE, something similar is critical um, uh, to take place in the, in, in, in the Middle East uh, as well. Um, you, you can't resolve uh, issues like uh, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, without engaging parties um, and focusing on parties on all the sides. And with, instead of focusing on a, what I believe ultimately is a side issue, the nuclear question, and ignoring the, uh, the, the, the conflicts that are currently the focus of people. It's like a patient dying of cancer. Um, in the, the region today is involved in what I believe is, is a regional world war. It's as significant as any regional war that we've ever seen. Um, and we need to focus on that, which is why I've been arguing that the Biden administration ought to be thinking big. It ought to be thinking big. It can't solve it on its own, but certainly with the P5 plus one, a broader security framework can be, can be uh, promoted. It may not succeed, but it will inspire, I believe, uh, people in the region to see a different future rather than sort of picking on the pieces of, of dealing with a negotiation in Libya or a negotiation here or a negotiation with Iran, we need to have a broader regional approach that can say to people, there may be a different future for us. The Middle East may be something different. Uh, the essential components are nuclear free, weapons of mass destruction free and respect for sovereignty and respect for non-aggression. Uh, those become critical issues but ultimately, I think uh, you can't solve each problem by itself. You've got to look at the region as a whole. And that is what my contribution to this discussion is. Thank you.